Stefan? You know, I I want to remind everyone we're going to have uh, we're going to have a meal after the service today, and uh, if you forgot, don't feel bad about it. I did too. Uh, I guess that happens with age, but at any rate, uh, we're going to we're going to eat, and we would love to have you to fellowship with us at the meal afterwards. So please stay, and then of course after that we'll be having the play day out of the arena. If you will, turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 14. We're going to read the first six verses there. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. You know, we all have our favorite <coughs> passages of Scripture. And uh, this has always been one of mine. And uh, I preach from it, I don't know how many times, uh, over the years. Uh, but, you know, it seems like, have you ever noticed how God's Word is such? God made His Word so that it doesn't matter how many times you may read it or study it, there's always something that God gives you that's new. I think, you know, we're all at different places in our lives at different times. And so the Holy Spirit, and that's what Jesus said. Uh, said in the, the following chapters here, if you want to read them whenever you get home, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. And God constructed the Bible, His Word, in such a way that the truth does not change. But as our lives, we, in our lives we face different circumstances and different times, different problems, different troubles, uh, God shows us something in His Word that we perhaps haven't seen before and perhaps we did not need before at this point in time. So, you may have read John chapter 14 many, many times. But please, listen, and let's see what God has for us on this reading, okay? John chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading. I'm going to go, we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 6. But let me... Let me kind of, as I always do, uh, let's, let's kind of get the context here. What's going on? <laughs> Jesus had just, uh, th this was the, the, you remember the Last Supper? You remember that painting that may have been, I remember it was in my grandmother's dining room. There was a painting of, of the Last Supper in my grandmother's dining room. And I remember my daddy moved into the house afterward. And, and I'm not making fun of my daddy by any stretch of imagination, but he was an artiste. <laughs> I looked at Rita when I said that. <laughs> my daddy took down the, the print of The Last Supper and put up his own version. You remember the paint by the numbers? <laughs> After he retired, my daddy started doing the paint by the numbers. And I'll tell you, it, God bless his soul, it looked like a three-year-old, didn't it? But, but uh, he put that up there. And that was always, you know, kind of an amusing thing for us to look at whenever we'd go down there. But you've probably seen many times the photo, not the photo, but the painting, or a copy of the painting of The Last Supper. You may not know it, but that really is not very accurate portrayal of The Last Supper. Because, you know, they're all sitting at what looks like this great big long picnic table, don't they? Well, yeah, well, that's the way the Europeans would do it. That's the way we still do it today. We're going to have some long tables out here in a little bit, and we're going to put, we're going to put some food out on it. That's the way we eat. But the Jews ate a little bit differently. Whenever they would sit down to eat, there would be a low table, and it was a lot, it may be square, it may be round, but it was a low table. And they would, they would gather around the table. They would prop up on one arm and they were sitting kind of reclining in, on cushions. And, you know, they would eat with their right hand or left hand, depending on which hand they had. Kind of reminds me of a cubby of quails in reverse. Instead of everybody facing away from the, you know, like quail do, facing away from the circle, that everybody was facing in. And that's just the way they did it. So, whenever it says that the disciple that was 
at Jesus' breast. What it's talking about is, you know, whenever you have something to say, if it's somebody right next to you, kind of behind you, you'd have to turn and kind of lean on their chest to say something to them. That was John. And that's the reason his words that way. But they're sitting down for this last meal. The only thing is, the disciples had not really perceived that it was the last meal. Now Jesus had been telling them for three years that he had come to minister, to set up his church, and eventually he would be crucified on a cross. He had been telling them this for three years, but you remember your mom and daddy telling you stuff and it just really didn't register. You really didn't believe. It just went in one ear and out the other. Well, that's the way it was with them, and we still do that even as adults, don't we? Finally, the time came. And Jesus told them, tonight I will be arrested. And tomorrow I will be crucified. You know, there's nothing like immediacy staring us in the face to get our attention, right? Nothing like that. And we've all had situations where we were told and told and told that something was going to happen, but we really weren't prepared for it whenever it did. Whether we believed it would happen or not, we just, you know, you know, kind of like you remember, did any of you see the movie Gone with the Wind? You remember like, Scarlett, well, was that her name, Scarlett? Or was that the actress? Uh, her name was Scarlett, Scarlett O'Hara, wasn't she? Okay? You remember whenever there was something she really didn't want to face and deal with, what would she say? I'll think about that tomorrow. Well, for the disciples, tomorrow is here today. And so Jesus was telling them all of this, and it was as though the world was crashing down on them because they had had very different ideas of what the ministry of Jesus would be. You see, in the Old Testament, there are actually two different prophecies about Jesus. The first one, the one that was happening here, was the suffering Messiah. The Messiah who would die for our sins. The second one was the conquering Messiah. The Messiah who would come and who would again sit on David's throne. And the state of Israel, the nation of Israel, would be restored. The line of David would be restored. Now let me ask you something. If you were a Jew in Jesus' day, which one would you really be wanting to happen and looking for? Hmm? You'd be wanting the one where the Messiah would come back. And here they were living under the tyrannical rule of the Roman government. You would want the one that to come back right then and right there and kick the old Romans out and set up the throne of David again. Now wouldn't you? That's the natural thing to do. And they really didn't understand about the suffering Messiah who would die for the sins of the world. What they didn't realize was until this moment was that Jesus was the suffering Messiah. Now we look back at that in time in 2,000 years and we say, how could they have missed that? Well, remember, we're looking backward in time. Isn't hindsight 2020, they say? Now there's something that hasn't happened yet that we can look forward to in the future and that is that Jesus is going to return again and he is going to set up his throne in Jerusalem. And the line of David, which he was part of the line of David, will be continued at that point in time. But they weren't looking for the suffering Messiah. And so, have you ever been disappointed? Have things ever not worked out the way you wanted them to? I have a 
say, I'm kind of spitting in the wind on that, aren't I? Because every last one of us had things that didn't work out the way we wanted them to. Maybe it was a marriage. Maybe it was a kid. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it was just life in general hadn't worked out the way you, you thought it would. We just had graduation, a lot of high schools. And our son just graduated from high school. And I think he's already starting to figure out that things aren't exactly going to turn out the way he thought they would. And so what were these disciples? They were disheartened. They were discouraged. Have you ever been disheartened and discouraged? Sure you have. I'm sure there's quite a few here today that probably right now are disheartened and discouraged about something. Listen to what Jesus said to them. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. But you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. First thing Jesus told his disciples, and the thing that, that I think is, is just speaks volumes about Jesus, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. And I don't know what you're going through today, and you don't know what I'm going through today. But you know, it's wonderful and a comfort to know that we have a Savior who wants to comfort us. And it does not matter what we're going through. And, and, and the thing is, we have a Savior, the Bible says, who knows exactly what it's like to go through what you're going through. Because He became a human. And he suffered the things that humans suffer. Heartache, trial, tribulation. You know, I'd like to stand up here and tell you that, that you know, life is going to be all hunky-dory from this point out. You'd know I was lying to you, wouldn't you? It, it isn't. The Bible never says it does. And preachers who get up and say, yeah, it will be if you'll just trust Jesus, are lying to you. Okay? Not something you expect to hear from a preacher, is it? But you know what? We have a Savior who says, it doesn't matter what's happening to you. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You know what? Jesus is trying to comfort them here. And Jesus wants to comfort you and me in all of our troubles. In all of our trials. You know, I've been saying for five years since I've been here, you know, that I'm, I'm there's no diff not much difference between me and you. I mean, you know, I'm so handsome. My wife keeps <laughs> telling me that. <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> but... I've been saying for five years, you know, I'm just like you. I put my pants on the same way. The only difference in five years is I don't put them on as fast as I did five years ago. And that's the truth. So the thing is this, we have a Savior that we can rejoice in, in knowing, and He wants us to know Him in a personal way. He wants to know us in a personal way. That whenever trials and tribulations and things don't work out the way we would like for them to work out or think that they should, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. 
You know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, trust me. Trust me. Everything is going to work out. It may not work out the way you want it to, but everything is going to work out. You see, God has a plan. God has always had a plan. And it does not matter what happens. It does not matter if, if the skies are gray or just black. We were driving back from Waco yesterday and we went through some areas where that sky was just so dark and black. And you know, sometimes life feels that way, doesn't it? We go through areas in our life where everything is just dark and black and we don't know that we're going to be able to make it. But you know what? Jesus would say to us, let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in me. Trust in my Father. Trust in me. Have faith. Have faith. You know, the Bible tells us that we come to know Christ, that we accept Him as our Lord and Savior by faith. We have faith that Jesus did go to die on the cross and that He rose again the third day. And we believe that He can save us from our sins. And that we have a home in heaven that He will provide for us. Have faith. But you know what? It's Faith is much more than just believing in Jesus for salvation. When, when, when Jesus said, have faith, let not your hearts be troubled. Have faith in God. Have faith in me. Whenever He said that, He was talking about all of the situations in our life. So whatever you're going through today, Jesus wants to bring comfort. You know what? When Jesus told the disciples that he was going to be crucified the next day, they thought, well, this is it. This is the end. And some of you may be going through situations where you think there's no recovery. This is the end. But you know what? Forty days after the resurrection, there was Pentecost. And if you had asked Peter on this night before Jesus was arrested and before he was crucified the next day, if you had asked Peter what his outlook was, it was totally different 40 days later. 50 days later. And the reason is because God has a plan. It's not our plan. It may not look too good to us at the time, but God has a plan. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Listen to this. My Father's house has many rooms. I like this, the word mansion. It's the old King James word mansion. I guess it's just a, you know, I'd rather have a mansion than a room any day, wouldn't you? Well, whatever it is, it isn't, that isn't important. My father's house has many rooms. You know what the important thing about this is? God has a place for us in heaven. That's the important thing. God has a place for us in heaven. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have not told you? I mean, you know, listen, Jesus is saying here, you know, I'm not going to leave you on. If it wasn't so, I would have told you so. But God has a place prepared for us. Would I have told you that I'm going to there to prepare a place for you? Would I have told you that I'm going to there to prepare a place for you? What they didn't understand was the way Jesus was going. I think their understanding, their spiritual understanding of what Jesus was talking about was about like mine was the first time I read this passage of Scripture. I was probably about 13 years old. You know? Though, you know, I come from a carpentry background. 
whole family. And uh, kind of like, like Mike back there, he comes from the same kind of family. But I came from that kind of family. Whenever I read, I go to heaven to prepare a place for you. My father's ma house, you know, are many mansions. I thought Jesus, what he's talking about was, you know, what I was familiar with. And that was Jesus was going to go to heaven and he was going to build heaven. You know, just like my uncle. Now, it wasn't my daddy. My daddy couldn't drive a nail straight to save his life. My mama could, but she was part of that family. That's what I thought. And that's probably what these guys thought. So, what? Are you, are you going to go to heaven and you're going to build us a house? That's not what Jesus was talking about at all. You know what he was talking about? Here's what he was talking about. He was going to prepare a place for us in heaven by first going to the cross and dying for our sins. That's what he was talking about. His mind was still on the crucifixion, the road ahead of him. He said, the reason I'm going and dying on the cross and the reason, as I've been telling you, I would arise on the third day is so that you will have a place. Now, you realize something? What would have happened if Jesus had got there? Just picture this in your mind. You know, Thomas Pilate gave, gave Jesus every opportunity to bail out on what he was to do. He gave him every opportunity. And Thomas Pilate tried every way he could to keep from crucifying Jesus. He was, he was afraid of Jesus. He didn't let on like it, but he was afraid of Jesus. <coughs> and so, he, uh, he was trying to get Jesus out of it. Well, all Jesus had to do was to deny that he was the Messiah. That's all he had to do. And he wouldn't have had to go to the cross. He wouldn't have been crucified. He could have got up there. What if he'd got up there? Have you ever been to, to, in a situation? Have you ever been in a situation where... You were looking death eye in the eye. Some of us have been in those situations. And what would you have done differently if you would known that there was something you could do to change the situation? You'd have changed the situation, wouldn't you? Jesus had every opportunity to bail out on us and go on living. His earthly life. What would have happened if Jesus had done that? We would not have a home in heaven. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is saying, I want to comfort you. I want you to have faith and tr trust in me and what I'm doing. And by going to the cross, I'm actually preparing a place for you in heaven. That if Jesus hadn't gone to the cross, there'd be a lot of empty rooms in heaven. Think about that. Not only that, look at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. I will come back and take you to be with me also where I am. Think about that for just a moment. Jesus was not just going to save us. He's coming back for us. He's made a promise. Now listen to this. You know, young people, have you ever been in a situation where, let's say, boyfriend or girlfriend made it clear they didn't want to be around you? Didn't want you anymore. Well, that hurts, doesn't it? Some of us as adults have had that happen to us. And it happened to me. That rejection is not something that's pleasant, is it? What did Jesus say about that? And about his relationship with us? You remember Jesus said, never will I forsake you. Never will I leave you. And Jesus said right here, I'm going the way of the cross. I'm going to the cross 
and the resurrection. And But I'm not going to do all that without coming back for you. Now there's comfort in that. And there's the promise that God has planned. And that he wants, you know what? God wants to have fellowship with me. God, you know, Jesus said, I want you to be where I am. I'm coming back for you. What if you received, I, I don't know who your person, you know, they interview these people and they say, who would you like to have dinner with? More than anybody else in the world, you know, they interview them. You know, these personalities and stuff. Who would who would be your your who would you want to have dinner with? And some of us, you know, will make the president of the United States. Some of us, maybe it's some athlete. Maybe it's some rodeo star. But we all have people we just like to sit down and eat with. But you know what? Jesus didn't wait for us to ask him. He said, I want to eat, sit down and, and eat with you. You know that just before this, he said, he said, this is the last meal I'll have with you until we sit down together in the kingdom of God. And that invitation is still open to us today. Jesus wants to sit down to eat with us. You know, eating has always been a very important part of fellowship. That's why we have this first Sunday. Something about food that just kind of not just fills the belly, warms the heart, we have opportunity to sit down and talk with each other and spend time with each other. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. When he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. <coughs> you know the place, the way to the place where I'm going. Now, I like Thomas. A lot of people don't. I think Thomas gets a bad rap. Call him Doubting Thomas. I think it's just honest Thomas, what he is. Because he asked the question that everybody else was wanting to ask and didn't. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? What did Jesus say? Thomas, don't you worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, you just, you just follow me. You just do what I tell you to do. You just follow my lead. Thomas, I'll get you there. And you know what? That's the truth. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says this. That it's not by works of righteousness that we have done. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Jesus is wanting to give it to us. For by grace are you saved through faith. Jesus just said, trust me, believe in me. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. <coughs> not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, I, uh, I've been in a lot of homes and ask people this question. If you were to stand before God and God said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? What would you tell God? He's standing there at the gates of heaven and said, why should I let you in? By and large, the largest number of us human beings say, well, I've tried to live a good life. You know what? You may have tried, but you failed. Just by saying I tried means you failed. You know it. I've tried to keep the Ten Commandments. Heard that. I've tried to be a good person. I've tried to do the right thing. But you know what? 
It says it's not by our works. It's by the grace of God. And Jesus said, the whole reason and purpose for my coming and the whole reason and purpose for my being arrested tonight and crucified tomorrow and on the third day rising again is so that I could save your soul from hell. It's by the grace of God. My friend, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what your spiritual walk is really like any more than you know what my spiritual walk is like. That's something that's between us and God. I mean, you know, I've seen some folks put on some shows before. And I'm sure God has too. You know what? I didn't know it till the end of the show, but God knew it when they started putting it on, whether it was real or not. But my friend, if you have never placed your trust and faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do it right now, right where you are. Some churches, by the way we do things, would lead you to believe it's done by walking down an aisle and taking a preacher by the hand and joining the church. Don't get the idea that filling out that green sheet back there is going to get you to heaven. Come on. The only way any of us will ever get to heaven is by faith that Jesus died on that cross of Calvary and rose again the third day. And you can have that peace and that knowledge right now where you sit and just ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life and save you Lord. And put your trust and faith in Him. Him alone. We're going to have to close the prayer. <coughs> Randall sang about me and God. I love that song, Randy. Me and God. You know what? Right now, it's just you and God here. Nobody else matters. As I lead us in prayer, <coughs> my prayer does not matter. What I say does not matter. But what you tell God silently in your heart is what matters. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for this day, and I thank you for your word. Thank you for your provision for us, and that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross and pay for our sins. That you raised him on that Easter, first Easter Sunday morning. And Heavenly Father, if there's anybody here today that has never placed their trust and faith in your son Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Help them to have faith. Help them just to believe. Help them to hear the words of Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Help them to stop trusting in whatever it is they may have been, as we probably all have at one time or another. Trusted in what her mama or daddy said. Well, you're a good little boy. Or you're a little, good, little, good little girl. As my mother said, I was a good little boy. And I believe her. But I wasn't that good. Maybe someone's here that we've been trusting on the church membership. Or our affiliation with the church. Or that mama and daddy were members of the church. Whatever it is, Heavenly Father, help us all to realize that it does not matter what we're trusting in. We're trusting in the wrong thing if we're not trusting in your son Jesus and his death on the cross and resurrection the third day to get us to heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, help each and every one here today not go through that back door until we have believed that your son Jesus died for our sins and rose again. I ask it in Jesus' name. And bless the food as we eat it. Amen. Amen. All right, as we uh, said, said at, the, at the end of the song service, give the ladies a little time.